Hello everyone and welcome to today's Just For Tummies live Facebook event. My name's Linda, I'm the founder of Just For Tummies and as some of you are probably aware, April is IBS Awareness Month so all through the month of April Just For Tummies have been sending out uh, newsletters about IBS and uh, we've been posting on social media a lot about IBS as well. Now, my guest today is someone that some of you will be familiar with because I've done several lives with um, with this particular lady. It's Sophia. She's a nutritional therapist and she was up until a week or so ago, Sophia Hill, but she's now Sophia Burrell or Burrell Sophia. I'm sure you'll correct me on that. So uh, without further ado, let me um, introduce Sophia to the live and um, we'll talk more about how to resolve IBS naturally without having to use drugs. <laughs> Hi, Hi Linda. <laughs> it's lovely to see you Sophia. Lovely to see you as well. How are you? How are, how are you after the... After, I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning that you got married recently. No, no, absolutely. Yes, I'm, I'm doing well. It's all been a bit of a whirlwind time so Yes, and getting back into reality now, which is um, a bit of a come down, I must say, from all the excitement. Sophia, <laughs> your dress was beautiful. The, the lace on it was absolutely stunning. I Thank mean, you. It was, it was lace, wasn't it? Yeah, it was handmade lace from, it was handmade in New Zealand, and it was, yeah, some special lace out there that they took a very long time to make and deliver. But yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So is it is it Burrell or Burrell? Well, I people say both depending on where they're from. So I say Burrell. Um people say Burrell, but yeah. Burrell. <laughs> so you don't really mind. No, I don't mind. <laughs> I still consider myself Hill at the moment. I'm not used to saying the other name. No, it's going so. to take me a while to learn you for so long as so I know. Me. I know. But we will get used to it. We will. So thanks very much for giving up your time today, Sophia, and, um, you know, to talk to us about IBS. And I know we've done lives before about IBS, and I'm always talking about IBS, and you are as well. But I don't think we can ever talk enough about IBS. No. Because it's such a huge problem and a growing problem that I, I just think we need to be reinforcing what IBS is, what it isn't, and what can be done naturally. Mm -hmm. to uh, you know to resolve the symptoms yep agreed definitely i'm i'm always yeah harping on about ibs i think because i have suffered with it myself when i was a teenager yeah. and going through all of that and going through the just disappointment of doctor's appointments and not having any real answers or help that kind of led me into what i did but also makes me want you know for other people not to have to go through that if they don't have to where they can yes. cut out some of the years that i went through and you know well, exactly. cut about, to the chase yeah, yeah. Nipping things in the bud isn't it i mean sophia um sorry I've, I've forgotten what what was it that caused your ibs that triggered your ibs i personally think it was overuse of antibiotics as a child so mm -hmm. i just had recurrent tons tonsillitis um mm -hmm. and just various little infections that they just dished out antibiotics i remember the yellow liquid so well the banana -y mm -hmm. penicillin i was always having it mm -hmm. I, I think i'd be horrified to see a list of how many antibiotics i've actually mm -hmm. taken in my life mm -hmm. and i think it was down to that disrupting my gut flora i never knew about probiotics when i was younger yeah. um so i think that really knocked out all my beneficial flora and then led me to actually developing SIBO which we'll come on to i'm sure we'll come but... on to that. yes yeah. yeah well i i have a similar story because like you i also suffered with tonsillitis quite a bit mm. girl. And, i mean I, I know i'm quite a bit older than you but i do remember that penicillin liquid and yeah uh, so i think it was like a strawberry flavor oh yeah it was quite nice actually yeah <laughs> it was. but i think that uh you know several courses um uh, several attacks of tonsillitis several courses of antibiotics um sort of predisposed me towards constipation mm. 
because of course you know we know that if if your gut bacteria is wiped out it can affect transit time in the bowel mm -hmm. and it can either slow it down or speed it up yeah in my case it slowed it down yeah so um <clears throat> i just to say uh, that um i've added a link to our ibs guide <clears throat> above this video so it's free to download everyone so it contains lots of useful advice and information on how to reduce ibs symptoms it's a really really useful guide that uh, sophia helped me write and i think you'll find it very very useful so let's have a look at this then so between one and two people in ten in the uk are thought to have ibs i mean we don't know the true figure because these are the ones that have had a proper mm. diagnosis and we know that there's many more people uh with symptoms of ibs and they probably have got ibs but they're too scared or embarrassed to see to yeah. see a gp and uh, i'm sure you find that as well sophie yeah i do and i think as well as embarrassment people often think it's just normal because they've had it for a long time and they're just mm -hmm. you know some people say to me when i ask them about their bowel movements and they say oh absolutely absolutely everything's absolutely normal and then i get the bristol stool chart up and i'm like just tell mm -hmm. me where your normal is and then I'm like that's not normal mm -hmm. um no. and but they think they just think it is because it's been happening for so long and they don't talk to other people about it so they just think mm -hmm. it, it is normal mm, it's such a taboo <clears throat> isn't it, talking about yeah. bowel movements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I've, I've never found it a problem you know because um well because i suppose being an ex-colon hydrotherapist you know day in and day no. out, <laughs> about poo, i was looking at poo and analyzing yeah do yeah. you tend to find as well you know when you show people the bristol stool chart um invariably they're on the constipated side or or on the loose side i think more often than not it's more the constipated side mm -hmm. i would say in my just in my own clinic but that's not to say it's you know everywhere but for me it's it's slightly more rare for the the diarrhea side to be yeah more prevalent i'd say i find that too yeah, too. yeah. so uh, we know that ibs sufferers score low on the quality of life scores mm. and there's little wonder really because of the you know the impact um on their quality of life that, that their symptoms have um yeah and GPs refer around 50% of their patients to gastroenterology for further investigations because they don't really know what, what else to do with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they may initially, I mean, they, they may initially do blood work to rule yeah. out certain conditions and they may um, recommend certain drugs as well. But um, if, the, if people are still getting symptoms, and I suppose depending on what type of symptoms and what age a person is, yeah. They they will refer to uh, to gastro gastroenterology for further uh, further investigations, and that, yeah. around ninety six percent of IBS sufferers cite bloating as a problem. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think agree with that too. I think that's one of the main things that people come to me with is bloating, abdominal mm. bloating, swelling, and then with that comes often abdominal pains, mm. um, and then obviously like gas as well, and then either constipation or diarrhea um which are the classic symptoms but bloating is the one that people are i find are most bothered about i think yeah yeah i, I have to agree definitely bloating yeah and um <clears throat> so some of the common causes of ibs i mean th th there are many i know but but the most common ones are antibiotics mm. and food poisoning um, yeah. and, and we'll go into a little more detail later why why antibiotics and food poisoning can cause IBS mm -hmm. but I just want to say that yeah around one in five people develop IBS after food poisoning mm. bag salad is one of the worst culprits for causing food poisoning undercooked meat next and I'm sure in your career as a nutritional therapist Sophie you've you've come across people who have developed food poisoning after they've eaten certain things i mean would you say that you know like lettuce bag salad yeah i've had quite a few people who i'm not going to name drop any supermarkets but um mm. the ready salads that you get in there and things and they said it was after that and i've never been right and then mm. it comes on to you know SIBO and all the rest of it which can be yeah, i just wonder if people when they buy this the, these bagged salads if they actually wash the salad that's inside or they just 
you know, stick it on the plate without washing it. I think people think it's washed and often it's not. It says you need to wash this, but people don't really seem to um, notice that on the packaging. But but not just wash it, you know, maybe get some Milton or some infant steriliser and get it in a bowl of water and put some steriliser and, Mm. you know, give it a good swish around. Definitely. Um, because I'm coming on to this now. I don't know if you've heard of this, Sophia. Rat lungworm. I don't think I have actually. Rat oh, lungworm. No. Rat lungworm. It's it, it's not very common. It is quite rare, but it's when um, a snail or a slug has slithered over some rat feces, oh. and then has slithered over some lettuce, for example. And it can cause, and then you eat that lettuce without washing it properly. Or, you know, you may have gone to a restaurant and had some lettuce and they've not washed it properly, Mm. whatever. And then it it can cause a rare form of meningitis. The symptoms I've put here, headache, stiff neck, pain, fever, nausea, vomiting. And I've put food poisoning, maybe a walk in the park. Yeah. Because that's where they get. They pass the brain barrier and they get into your brain, these worms. Mm. I mean, it's it's just shocking. That is awful, really awful. So let's get on to IBS then. So what is IBS? So if if you want to explain, Sophia, if you don't mind, that IBS is a functional gut disorder. It's not organic. And what that means exactly? Yeah, so I think with uh, IBS, it's not that you can particularly do a, a test, for example, like you can't do an IBS test, it's more of a case of ruling out um, different things, like ruling out serious things with various blood tests, um, sometimes more um, in intrusive tests like colonoscopies, etc. cetera. Um, and it's looking at symptoms. So it's more of an umbrella term. So it's, mm. it's a collection of these symptoms that we mentioned earlier, like the bloating, the inconsistent bowel movements, the constipation, the diarrhea, the all those symptoms. If you've got those and you haven't got anything like um, an IBD, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, or um, say colon cancer or something that they've ruled out, then we we know that it's going to be classed as IBS. But mm-hmm. for me, still, IBS is not enough, really. It's not really saying why or what it's just, it is. Not it's just enough, saying it? it's, just not, good it's enough. just not good enough no it's just it's not digging enough down to what and why yes we, we know you've got those symptoms anyway you've gone with those so we still want to know why but often people are just told this is it it's, it's ibs you learn to live with it it's um yeah something that you've just got to carry on with and maybe take some drugs like you said earlier to try and manage the symptoms um however in my experience, there are many root causes that are missed from the GPs and even the gastroenterologists that yeah. can be resolved if we know what we're looking for, if we know about the root causes, if we really understand the gut microbiome, if we understand all the bacteria, if we understand someone's exposure, if we look at a functional medicine timeline of events to see what and where things have been happening that have pinpointed um, certain areas to lead to the symptoms. Um, Yes, I just want to come in there, sorry Sophia, but it is so important, isn't it, to take a good case history of the client. And and this doesn't happen in primary and secondary care because they really don't have time. It's not their fault. They just don't have time to really dig deep and do that detective work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And I think my intake forms are about 15 pages long that's probably going to put everyone off but they're, they're a lot of them are tick boxes but it really does go into your history and great detail and your symptoms in great deal, detail and some of the root causes that people might think why the hell is she asking me this but it I all know. does tie in for me to, to understand I get the thing well, I'm sure when someone's completed those forms you can just scan down and you've got a pretty good idea yeah. at the end of it what's caused their IBS yeah it can be very obvious sometimes, but sometimes it does take a lot more figuring out um, yes. depending on the case. But and that's where testing comes in, of course. I mean, absolutely. I think about 15% of the NHS drug budget is taken up with, with IBS medication. Yeah. You know, antispasmodics, um, motility drugs, you know, drugs yeah. to slow the bowel down, to speed it up. Um, 
antidepressants because often people are put on an antidepressant not not because they're depressed although they might be if they've got chronic IBS yeah but just to try and just to try and relax the bowel it's um and it, and it is a growing problem because when I first went into clinical practice many years ago 30 years ago the term IBS irritable bowel syndrome was 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 very little known people mm. used to call it spastic colon which I think is an awful mm. terrible term didn't they spastic colon yeah. because they thought that the, 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 the bowel just um went into spasm mm. And we know that parts of the bowel can go into spasm, but other parts of it can be loose and floppy and flaccid. Yeah. Um, it may not be the whole bowel that, 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 that's gone into spasm. So, so yeah, so yeah, common so common symptoms of IBS, and we know about the bloating. I think that's the main one, isn't it, Sophia? Uh, pain, irregular pain. bowel movements. Um, and I find as well, you know, again, and this all comes down to the consultation form and case history, that a lot of people who have IBS also have hiatus hernia and mm. acid reflux. And I think there's a big, big connection there. Definitely. Because if your 23 feet or so of intestines are stretched, expanded, bloated, either due to excess gas or inflammation then they're going to push upwards and put pressure on the diaphragm put pressure on the stomach and you know mm -hmm. the chest cavity the lungs and potentially push acid drenched food out of the stomach up the esophagus and yeah. also affect the breathing and i know this from colon hydrotherapy because you know i've treated thousands of people with colonics who have been very bloated mm. um and as soon as you know we start the colonic the, the, the bloating begins to subside and they find oh i can breathe I can breathe I can, yeah i can take a big inhalation again whereas before because there was so much pressure being put on the diaphragm and the chest cavity sort of fixate fixating the the the, the, the rib cage the lungs couldn't um expand properly mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you can you think of any other not so common um, symptoms of IBS? I think fatigue um, is one of them that people don't seem to maybe associate with IBS, but that often comes from having nutrient deficiencies because if you have got malabsorption, if you've got mm. low stomach acid, if you've got mm. SIBO, if you've got parasites, all of those things, then you are going to not be able to absorb your food properly or your nutrients. So often people have got anemia, um, they can feel extremely fatigued. Um, so they're symptoms that people don't necessarily associate with IBS, but very much I see them coming um, hand in hand. And I think you mentioned low mood as well. Um, yeah. Again, pe that's a bit of a chicken and egg. People think, have I got low mood because I'm you know depressed about the way my life is because of my IBS I can't go anywhere I'm in pain or is it to do with that gut brain connection which often it is we've got the the, the gut and the brain linked intrinsically by the vagus nerve mm -hmm. um and they do send messages to each other and mm -hmm. Certain bacteria, particularly things like SIBO, can um, bacteria associated with SIBO, should I say, can secrete toxins, which are I think we mentioned last time about the LPS toxins, which can mm -hmm. pass mm -hmm. the blood brain barrier. And that can affect, you know, things like mood, anxiety, depression. So there again, things I mean, I think anxiety is one I see a hell of a lot with people who have IBS. Um, mm -hmm. And often once we've resolved, say it's SIBO or something, the anxiety just melts away. Yeah. So I do think again chicken and egg but i do think there's a huge uh, mental side to go along with ibs that people don't realize um and sleep disturbances i see quite a bit as well with mm. alongside with ibs yes yeah. yes i mean the, the the physical aspects of ibs um you know when it comes to sleep the the, the pain you know stomach mm. cramps or <clears throat> you know having to get up in the middle of the night to uh, to have a bowel movement and, and acid reflux in particular oh definitely um, that one. You know, lots of people just cannot get a good night's sleep because of their acid reflux keeping them awake yeah. and i often recommend i mean oh yes you can lift your bed head up you know you can have two or three pillows but um, I often recommend a couple of charcoal capsules, you know, before bed. And it really mm. does help soak up that acid in the stomach so people yeah. can, you know, get a good night's sleep. So um, I think 
I think you did cover when IBS isn't IBS and how important it is to have a correct diagnosis. And, you know, I would urge anyone who has IBS symptoms to go and see their GP. I mean, mm. GPs are seeing people with IBS all the time, aren't they? Yeah, all the time. So, you know, don't, don't yeah. be embarrassed. Don't be afraid. Just just go and get checked out because it may be something more serious than than, than IBS. And yeah. yes, uh, you also touched on, you know, important to rule out celiac disease, disease with, and celiac disease is an autoimmune uh, disease, isn't it? Where yeah. someone is, um, yeah, where, where gluten attacks the lining of the gut, basically, yeah. and uh, makes it permeable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In, that, much that, that, that's the simplest explanation anyway. Yeah. So it can cause leaky gut, can't it? Absolutely. I, mean, I, I wanted to say, I don't know if you agree, Sophia, but would you say that everyone that has celiac disease would have some level of leaky gut? Yeah, I would. I, I, I would have to say that because by, by the time someone, we're going off on a tangent again, <laughs> Always. by the time someone has been diagnosed with um, with celiac, they've had it many, many years. So yeah. the damage to the villi has been done, hasn't it? Yeah. And we know that gluten even in the absence of celiac disease can mm. cause permeability to the tight junctions in the gut. So yeah. especially if you've then got a load of autoimmunity and high levels of inflammation in the gut, um, mm. then you are very much prone to having intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's <clears throat> so common and it's, it, it's, it's on the rise as well. All of these conditions are, are on the rise. Um, so, um, Tests that a natural health therapist, a nutritional therapist like you, would carry out to determine if someone has IBS. I know there are lots of tests, so if you can just keep it brief, uh, because we've got lots more to get through. So yes, here. I will. Well, I suppose people come with me usually ha already thinking or knowing that they have IBS, but I am looking at tests that will say why they might have the IBS. So the most common ones that I carry out are gut microbiome tests. So they're stool tests that look at your gut microbiome. They look at the host markers as well. So host being the person. So things like digestive enzyme secretions, bile acid secretions, inflammatory markers, leaky gut markers. And then they also look at the microbiome markers. So looking at all your different commensal bacteria, gram negative bacteria, LP LPS producing bacteria, parasites, yeasts, um, a whole host, low pages of bacteria that we look at. And to someone wouldn't mean a lot, but to me, I can identify, you know, which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, which are the really bad ones and how we can bring that back into balance. So that's a stool test, which I run very, very frequently. And then there is a SIBO test, which is another one that I run very frequently in my clinic for IBS um, clients. Um, there's research, there's a study out there that shows that showed that 70 to 80 percent of cases of IBS were actually SIBO. Mm -hmm. So that's why I run SIBO tests a lot in my in my clinic. And not I don't always get it right, but a lot of times, most times, um, if I suspect SIBO, we often it is often right. But there are times where people don't actually have SIBO, but then we might look at other things like the stool testing um, and that can shed light on, on other areas as well. So mm -hmm. SIBO and stool test for IBS clients are my main two, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And yeah. approximately how much do these tests cost, Sophia? So the SIBO test is around 160 um and the stool test is a lot more but it depends sort of how many markers you might want to do you might want to do a more basic one but the all singing all dancing one that i recommend so we're not missing any markers is about 350 mm. so it's mm. quite quite a bit more pricey but absolutely invaluable i find for mm. the information that we can find off there well, is so, someone who's got chronic ibs and they've tried everything and it's having a massive impact impact on their quality their quality of life yeah it it's is um, they may want to consider yes. definitely yeah okay well thank you very much for that um i just thought we'd mention a few little simple tips that people can perhaps try 
to um, help reduce their IBS symptoms, more sort of dietary and, and lifestyle mm. tips, really. So we, we know about gluten, don't we? We know that even if someone mm -hmm. um, hasn't got celiac disease, that, that gluten can can damage uh, mm -hmm. the lining of, of the um, of the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is there a link here between gluten, wheat, <laughs> And uh, although there's gluten in, in, in other grains, I know, and, and, and glyphosate. Yes, definitely. Um, in fact, a lot of people... What, do you want to explain what glyphosates are and how they can increase the risk of getting IBS, Sophia? Yeah, so, so I mean, a lot of people will actually argue the fact that it's not necessarily the gluten in, in certain cases that the problem is. It's the glyphosate, which is a pesticide residue, essentially, mm. that is sprayed onto foods and it's heavily, heavily sprayed onto wheat crops in mm. particular. Um, so this is definitely still present in the food chain unless you have organic produce and then you won't be exposed to it. You may still be exposed to it a bit because we can't usually remove it 100%. But... Um, huge traces of it in normal sort of supermarket breads and things that people generally get. So um, glyphosate being a, a pesticide can and does have antibiotic properties. It's there to kill off pest, uh, pests. Mm -hmm. So it has a similar effect on our gut. So it can wipe out our beneficial bacterial strains like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium. Mm -hmm. So and it's also very a toxin. It's a it's a toxin. So we can sometimes have a reaction to that, not just the gluten. Sometimes we can have a reaction because we the pesticide is actually having that antibiotic effect in our gut. Mm -hmm. um, and then it can also be the gluten on top of that that might be worsening the person's symptoms. So is is there a test to determine if someone does have high levels of this pesticide in their blood? There is actually. Um, I run, I think we mentioned it last time actually, I, I run an Envirotox profile yeah, yeah. and that's looking at, it looks at a variety of things like mold toxins, but it also has a whole profile on pesticides as well. So you can, it looks at glyphosate in particular, but a whole list of other um, pesticides and um, fungicides and herbicides, etc. And glyphosate is on there, so you can test for it, yeah. Mm. Isn't it odd, though, how, you know, you might get one person who consumes a lot of gluten, you know, not not organic gluten, mm. and, and then the next person, uh, and, and they're fine, they don't get any symptoms whatsoever, but the next person, you know, they really, they really suffer. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it comes down to a person's constitution, to genetics, um and, and to, you know to, to their their immune health and what 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 whatever else is going on in in their body i think so yeah i think it's a an accumulative thing that mm. if you've ha had loads of antibiotics if you've had loads of food poisoning episodes if you've got a weakened yeah. immune system if you've had certain medications that can destroy your gut flora yeah loads if of stress not good if you've got high stress levels then you add in gluten that's moldy oh there's just so many so many so factors. much exactly so i think someone who has not got much exposure to those things can probably handle the gluten but someone who's had a lot of these exposures over their lifetime will have a lot more trouble in in dealing with breaking down gluten and, and digesting it Mm, yes yeah that's true and, and when, when I went to the Viva May clinic to train there in Austria a few times we, we used to talk about constitution you know and if mm. somebody's got a, a strong constitution and people who have got strong constitutions you can see them you know just just, just sit down for five yeah. minutes and observe people walking about and, and you'll see them they tend to be bigger they tend to do, <laughs> they just look stronger <laughs> stronger yeah. um, and, and so anything that's thrown at them you know their immune system just seems to cope better with yes. it yes and i think that's a lot to do with genetics really yeah uh right so this old adage here breakfast like a king lunch like a prince and supper like a pauper <laughs> and uh i think everyone must know this this quote but i they think know. maybe not <laughs> But, may, but maybe not everyone understands what it means. I don't know if you want to explain. <laughs> yeah, I think most people are more aware nowadays that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. That's when our, you know, in terms of Chinese medicine and things, our sort of 
stomach chi is its strongest earlier on in the day yeah. um and we are likely to more needing of a, a bigger meal after an overnight fast um so we want to be having a bigger more protein rich meal in the morning to sustain us we can digest it better in the morning and again lunch is is a lighter option and we've got it back to front though here because we have mm -hmm. a huge meal in the evening and that's when um, this stomach chi is not at its strongest and this is where we're going to sleep and we, the body wants to rest. It doesn't want to be breaking down loads of steak and protein and, and all the rest of it when we, we want to have that overnight fast and rest. So I do think we have, have got it totally wrong. We have a bowl of cereal in the morning, mm. you know, a sandwich at lunch and then we have a huge meal in the evening and it, it really is quite backwards actually. Oh, yes. And then people wonder why they can't get to sleep at night because, you know, that food, it's still in the stomach or, you know, the, the small intestine. And because there's there may not be enough um, digestive secretions, it's just sitting there and mm -hmm. it's fermenting and putrefying away, isn't it? Creating lots of uncomfortable gas. Absolutely. Yeah. So. I think that's a really good saying to bear in mind, actually, if you have IBS and see that sometimes can make a big difference for people. Mm -hmm. um, and also just while we're on this topic of sort of when to time meals as well, meal spacing can be very, very helpful for people who have IBS. So we have the overnight fast where our body can do all of its cleaning work. So we want to have that small intestine nice and clean. So that's what our migrating motor complex does. It keeps it nice and clean. Overnight, it gets to do loads of that work. But in between meals, when we're exposed to bacteria and things from the food we eat, it also wants to be able to do a good clean. Mm -hmm. But if we keep snacking in between our meals, the migrating motor complex cannot do the cleaning work. So yeah, built bacteria build up. I agree with this five or six meals. No, I really don't. Mm. I think unless you have got serious, terrible blood sugar issues and yeah. you absolutely need it, then it's just not necessary. And it's it's messing up our digestive systems. Keep on snacking and grazing throughout mm. the day. We should be having enough protein with each meal yeah. to sustain us through to the next meal, and we should be having about a three to four, four ideally gap hour gap in between the meals yes. that gives the digestive system a chance to clean and, and repair after digesting a whole meal yeah i absolutely agree thanks for pointing that out sophia yeah uh, all right so uh, oh i've lost my other one. Oh yes <laughs> i'm always going on about teeth the importance oh of yeah <laughs> you know to properly masticate food because the stomach doesn't have teeth no. And yeah, so I'm always talking about teeth, how important teeth are in masticating food and, 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 and a good fitting pair of dentures is better than, you know, missing, missing teeth, in, in, in my opinion, because that mastication is so important. Definitely. And I, I remember the first time someone said to me about your stomach doesn't have teeth. And I just thought, gosh, yeah, it's just you feel like it would have some sort of mechanism but it doesn't you have to chew the food very very well until it's like apple sauce consistency before you swallow it yeah. um otherwise you're going to have more of the bloating more of the discomfort more of the gas after you eat yes i always say drink your food and and eat your drink so, yeah you know, chew your food until it's like a paste before you swallow yeah. it and even when you drink something just swish it around your mouth so it can collect some saliva and enzymes before, before you swallow it it's so important and it makes such a massive difference doesn't it correct chewing absolutely and i think that's so true what you just said there about the drinks because people often have a smoothie and they just drink it all down and then it just this whole mass lands in the stomach and it's not had the proper uh, enzyme secreted that we have when we chew mm. so i say to people even if you've got a smoothie try and even just chew it a tiny bit in the mouth before you just literally swallow all this liquid yes yeah i absolutely agree so let's just touch a little bit on supplements that help to reduce ibs symptoms so for me you know being a practitioner and developing a range of supplements these are the key ones that i find help most people probiotics live bacteria digestive Definitely. enzymes omega-3 capsules because of you know the short chain fatty acids in helping to reduce infection inflammation and bowel cancer and the charcoal capsules i mean i might put the charcoal capsules as number three actually because it and i often recommend 
a five day charcoal cleanse before anyone begins a supplement protocol anyway, just to make sure everything's been, you know, swept clean in the digestive Definitely. system. I don't know if you can add any more there, um, Sophia. Your I think supplement. supplement supplement form, obviously it depends why you've got IBS. If we go with this whole sort of theory that 70 to 80 percent of cases of SIBO mm. uh, that have caused the IBS, then we need to be thinking about some sort of antimicrobial as well to make sure that we reduce the bacteria that's causing the problem. So something like garlic capsules, mm. berberine, there's a whole list, oregano oil needs yeah. to be specific to the type of SIBO that you have, though. Mm -hmm. um so there's there's three types of SIBO and each require different antimicrobials in a different approach so this is where it becomes very personalized because yes. you might think you have SIBO but you might not know which type you have and if you take the wrong type of antimicrobial for the wrong type for the type of SIBO that you have you can actually do more damage because you're not killing off the bacteria that it doesn't work on that type you might start to just then kill off some of the good bacteria in your gut like the lactobacillus strains that are quite delicate mm -hmm. So antimicrobials, but word of caution on there to make sure you know what you're dealing with before you just willy nilly go and start taking them because they can be quite harsh mm -hmm. if you take them. They shouldn't be taken long term either. Yes. Um, so can you just touch on the three different types of SIBO then? Sophie. Mm, absolutely. So we've got methane. So that is more associated, not always though, but usually more associated with constipation and a mm -hmm. slower transit time. So it's associated with methanogenic bacteria, which can slow down the gut. So people mm -hmm. have yeah more constipation. We also then have hydrogen um, that can be constipation or diarrhea um, prone. So um, and the third type is hydrogen sulfide. And that mm -hmm. one is mostly associated with diarrhea but not always again there are some um, exceptions to the rule there um, at the moment in the UK we actually can't test for hydrogen sulfide there is a test in the U USA which is available but it hasn't come over here yet unfortunately so when interpreting a SIBO test result we have to consider you know that there could be another gas going on that's not measured and you can see that sometimes from a um, flat lining result on the graph that there might be some Sorry, hydrogen, sulfide. The third one, then, hydrogen sulfide what, what would yeah. the symptoms be so very similar so we'll have bloating we'll have gas we'll have usually a diarrhea will be present but not always like i say so i can't really say definitely for the for the diarrhea it could still be um constipation and particularly if you've got methane as well you can have both types or three types of SIBO all in one so if you have methane and hydrogen sulfide you may swing between having constipation and also having diarrhea mm -hmm. and obviously you know if um the the, the, the SIBO pro eradication protocol um mm -hmm. you need to be quite strict you know your client needs to be quite strict with it in terms mm -hmm. of the supplements the um the, the diet as well is, is that correct yeah. It is, yeah. It's quite a, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say gruelling, that's probably too harsh, but it can be a bit of a long-winded process. You've got to make sure that you're, yeah, taking the correct supplements, that you're eating the correct foods and you're not, you know, gorging on all sorts of the wrong foods that you can't have. And also the stress management is something that has to be um, thought about as well in that protocol. And I'm sure you point this out right at the beginning of the journey, don't you, Sophia? So people know what to what to expect. Yeah, I always give a time frame and I always say to people, this is not a quick fix. Yeah. It will not go away overnight. You are going to. And I always say to people as well that healing from these kind of things is not linear. You may sometimes have, you know, a little slip back and people think, oh, no, that's the end. But it's not. Sometimes the graph can just be a bit, you know. Yeah it's not always just going to go in a perfect lovely straight line and, yeah. and you will have certain times where it's not you know you might feel like it's you're not moving in the right direction but eventually it will be worth it once you have you know seen the whole thing through and and, and how long on average is is the SIBO protocol that really depends on the test results because it, it depends one what type of SIBO you have so methane is actually harder to treat and longer to treat than hydrogen mm -hmm. um also it depends how high the levels of the gases are on the test so if someone's got 40 parts per million then it will be a lot less to treat than someone who's got 180 parts per million of hydrogen or methane going on so it really yes. is individualized and it, that's why the test is very important
Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right, so I just want to say, sorry, uh, welcome everyone, if you've just joined us, to our live event today, How to Resolve IBS Naturally Without Drugs, with my guest, um, nutritional therapist, Sophia Burrell. Are you going to change your email address, by the way, Sophia? Oh, maybe down the line. I, it's such I'm a not pain, sure. isn't it? It is. <laughs> and my whole business is Sophia Hill Nutrition. So I'll probably keep that for a while while yeah, I yeah. think about, yeah. But it just a lot of other... mind, that's all. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So a few questions then. Can you be born with IBS? Um, well, yes, I think you can. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I have clients who, you know, newborn babies who've got um, acid reflux and constipation and the mm. child hasn't been to the toilet for two weeks. And I think it can be a lot down to, you know, the health of the mother and what have they been exposed to in their pregnancy or mm. prior? Like, how was their gut health? Because we have to remember that the child... The, the microbiome for the baby is passed on from the mother so you know even whether they're born c-section or naturally can can be really impactful um so i i would say yes you can be absolutely i agree um you know <clears throat> if, a, if a pregnant woman has to take <clears throat> antibiotics for whatever reason those antibiotics are going to pass through uh, the umbilical cord and the placenta mm -hmm. to the baby and and likewise if the mother you know if she's breastfeeding and she has to take antibiotics um you know they're going to be passed through the breast milk to the baby and could increase its risk of ibs type symptoms mm -hmm. um especially constipation yeah uh, you know I, i'm always sort of talking i mean i, I get lots of inquiries from people and and, and like this morning I had an inquiry, an email, and um, no, sorry, it was last night. And this lady said, can I take your For Women probiotic capsules if I'm pregnant? Yes. <laughs> I would actively encourage any pregnant woman to take uh, a probiotic. Well, you know my stance on probiotics. I think everyone should be taking them anyway. I know. <laughs> in the water supply, so everyone gets oh, yeah. it with a daily dose. Uh, and so, yes, you know, I, I went on to explain why it's important to um, to take probiotics. And certainly if a pregnant woman has had antibiotics or, you know, she's breastfeeding and she's mm -hmm. taking antibiotics, it's just crucial that she uh, takes probiotics and the baby takes a suitable infant probiotic yeah. as well. Agreed. Um, right, this one crops up a lot. Can the menopause trigger IBS? Yes, we actually did a whole live on this, didn't we, Linda? A few months yes. ago, maybe last year. But yes, we did. It can. And if anyone wants to watch that live, if they go onto the Just for Tummies website and they click on Linda's blogs, there's a category down the right hand side. I think it does say health videos. Uh, and all of the videos um, are in there and, and that one about menopause and uh, and IBS and how menopause can affect um, the digestive system is there. Yeah, and it, it's all to do with the hormones and the depleting levels of hormones and the kind of fluctuating levels of hormones before we go into menopause. And then when we go into menopause, the severe depletion of the hormones like the um, estrogen and progesterone, that can really affect our digestion because it can impact our cortisol. Cortisol can suppress our stomach acid production, which can then result in things like bloating and maldigestion of foods. Um, and as another example, like low progesterone can can cause slow transit time. So mm -hmm. it's all about those hormonal levels and how we can support those to best support our gut. Um, and and our I'm assuming that you you know you can do a hormone um, uh, panel panel yeah test as well. Yes, yes, I do yes. hormonal testing. So yes. one of my favourite ones is the Dutch test. Looks at the dried urine of hormones, and it's so comprehensive. And it looks at yeah all your hormones in in great detail. Yeah, that's been around for a long time, hasn't it? The Dutch test. Yeah, it's my favourite one for oh, hormones. Okay. okay, that's interesting. And I know as well, just going off topic again, that you know the vaginal microbiome test as well that uh, that helps women who have. UTIs, thrush, bacterial vaginosis. Absolutely. It's another one of my favourite tests because it's just it's just so insightful. And people who've struggled with these things for so long, we can then see from the data that they've got 
X, Y, and Z, bacterial overgrowth pathogens, mm. and they are directly linked to things like um, BV or thrush, mm. certain ones. So we know if we can reduce those, yeah. we can get that microbiome in the vagina balanced again and yeah, the symptoms yeah. can be... I mean, the number of inquiries I get from people, you know, Sophia, from women who, yeah. have, um, who have IBS, and when I start to dig a bit deeper, you know, uh, many of them have also had multiple um, UTIs over the years. Oh, and yeah. Lots of antibiotics as well. And so there's there's the connection, you know. Absolutely. UTIs, antibiotics, IBS. There we go. I know all of, a lot of it does trace back to antibiotics, I'd say. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure what the what the guidance is now. The nice guidance um, to GPs and and antibiotics. I think they do seem to be less reluctant now to just write a prescription out for antibiotics. But um, I think it, it it must be difficult for GPs because if they suspect an infection, um, what 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 else do GPs have in their armory? you know, to uh, to help prevent or to help stop an infection other than antibiotics because they haven't had our training, no. you know, our natural naturopathic training. We know what the natural antibiotics are and not yeah. just natural antibiotics. You know, it, it's a big subject, isn't it, Sophia? It, yeah. It's about underpinning the immune system, really, isn't it? That, that, that's what we need to do, strengthen and make the immune system more resilient so people don't succumb to infections in, in the first place. A hundred percent. And I think that the, obviously the antibiotics are just doing exactly the opposite. They are destroying our gut bacteria, which is 90% of our immune system. Yeah. So keep doing that makes us more susceptible. So they give us more antibiotics and that makes us more susceptible for more infections. It's such a vicious cycle to get into yeah. beyond belief. It's just, and it's so hard to get out of once you've started on that recurrent antibiotic. Uh, antibiotic um sort of cycle it's, it's so so difficult because people I mean, are thinking these could just could just intervene a little bit okay you know write out your antibiotic prescription but then recommend probiotics yeah to help replenish and recolonize but but they don't because it's not part of the nice guidelines so i know they, they just don't they don't do it they don't do it no. right one of the questions that was raised was um histamine okay yeah uh, and histamine intolerance being linked to ibs can can you just explain so sophia what what histamine what, what a histamine intolerance is and how it can affect you know digestive and gut health yeah and i general, see general health of course general health absolutely i see histamine intolerance a lot with mm -hmm my SIBO clients particularly oh, yeah. um yeah it seems to be very common and there's a few reasons why um so if I just kind of explain a bit about what histamine is and does and that might help to piece together how it links in with SIBO so usually we have sort of if we if we take this analogy of a bucket we have a sort of tolerable level of histamine that we can usually um tolerate in our bodies so we our bodies really our bodies mast cells which line the tissue for most of our body release histamine and that can be down to pollen it can be down to foods we eat it can be down to all sorts of things where the immune system is involved so, so it's an immune response histamine releases an immune yeah, response yeah. absolutely yeah so when we are yeah, say we're exposed to some pollen or some grass or something, your immune system will ha will um, release some histamine. So that adds to this bucket. So then we might eat some foods which naturally contain histamine and that adds some more histamine to the bucket. Or we might eat some foods that are natural histamine liberators. Now, usually when this bucket gets quite full, we have a drain at the bottom. So it's essentially like a tap. This tap is actually an enzyme called DAO. Yeah. And DAO helps us to break down histamine in the body so that we can then not have this bucket overflowing. When we have the bucket overflowing with histamine, Ooh. that's when we get this real histamine intolerance, these reactions where there's too much histamine going on. Um, so these can literally affect as I said, the mast cells line most of the whole of the body. So it can affect so many systems in the body. It can affect our gut. It can affect all of our nasal cavities and our sinuses. It can affect our skin. Mm. It can just affect everything, basically. So it's a very horrible thing to experience. Now, SIBO 
the bacteria involved in that can actually degrade the DAO enzyme. So it means mm. that you're not able to then um, detoxify the excess histamine. And some bacteria produce their own histamine as well. So that's going to mm. add to that bucket load of histamine. So we need to think about the root cause of the histamine intolerance. We need to think about the immune system. We need to think about the gut bacteria. We need to think about if there's any underlying infections. Um, to balance those out and, and supporting those mast cells as well to calm them down because they can often be yeah, so overreactive. No, no that, you know, these histamine foods, the, these tend yeah. to be the aged foods, don't they? The, um, yeah. and, fermented, and fermented foods as well, some fermented foods. Yeah, and they're often all the foods that are recommended to people to support their gut health, support their yeah. immune system. Sauerkraut, kombucha, fermented yeah. milks and kefir and everything, they're very high in histamines. Um, but often unsuspecting things and the healthy foods so things like tomatoes aubergines spinach they're all very high in histamine as well um, and things like alcohol and um, chocolate that is very random all the different foods that uh, that contain histamine but it can definitely be linked to um, IBS and it can be definitely linked to SIBO it can be linked to yeah all sorts of all sorts of gut symptoms as well as all the sneezing symptoms and the itching skin and the itching oh, the hives, hives, well. the hives yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, and well, the last question is one that we've already covered actually. Yes, I've suffered yes. Years, for many years and now I've developed IBS. Is there a connection? Well, well, yes, there is. If, if you have any persistent infection where you're having to where you're being prescribed antibiotics um, to try and resolve it, then you are putting yourself at a higher risk of, of getting IBS. And I remember a couple, just a couple of weeks ago, um, a lady contacted me and she'd got, she'd got a boil. I'm trying to think where she had the boil now. It might have been in the groin. It wasn't a lymph node, it, it, it was a boil. And she'd been given a course of antibiotics to treat this boil. And I can't help but think that, that, that there's just better ways of, of treating boils, you know, from a naturopathic approach anyway. And mm. I would, first of all, use heat. I would want to uh, draw the boil more to the surface mm. using heat, you know, hot flannels, hot compressors, and then maybe have, it, have a go at, at, at lancing it myself. That's, yeah that's what i do <laughs> having antibiotics it's a bit like um a sledgehammer to crack a nut really when you yeah. have something as simple as a boil um and i think if someone was getting recurring boils as well they seriously need to look at detoxing definitely because there's something going wrong in the body if someone is getting recurring boils wouldn't wouldn't you agree absolutely i would i think the skin is the is the largest detox organ in our body yeah. so if we've got a backed up liver a backed up gut if we've got constipation and all these toxins it will come out in the skin and we can suffer with a variety of skin conditions and boils are one of them yes i remember many many years ago before i became a natural health practitioner so i'm going back over 30 years now i used to work in a bank and one oh. of the guys i used to work with a lovely chap um we got on really well and i used to sit next to him we had desks next to each other and he always used to be getting these boils on the back on the back of his neck you know Sophia mm. and back then I didn't know anything about well I didn't know a lot about natural health I mean my my paternal granddad was a, a herbalist uh, and, and so I knew a little from him and I kind of knew that you know getting boils like that was, was not good was not healthy was not natural was not normal anyway um and yeah and he must have he must have had antibiotics for him i don't know i can't remember it's a long time ago but he'd get these awful recurring boils on the back of his neck that would scar you know cause cause scars mm. and, and then i found out um, i left the bank and i trained in complementary therapies and then i found out a few years later that he died of cancer and right. i just got no thinking that you know there was a connection there between yeah. the was filled boy you know his body his body trying to expel something yeah and that's a massive warning sign to me it's like a klaxon going on absolutely you know what i know now and um and the cancer oh gosh yeah 
and we know that the cancer does have a big toxic burden kind of root cause to it so yeah i would agree with you linda well yes and, and cancer it's end stage inflammation infection isn't it really mm -hmm. yeah right well i'm going to wind things up now so okay. um i hope everyone's enjoyed the today's live i'm going to be sending it out in a newsletter so if you get our newsletters uh, people you'll be getting this in a newsletter and it will also be going on the blog under health videos and uh, it will remain on the just for tummies um facebook page as well so you can watch it anytime you like so thank you very much for joining us and i hope it's helped i hope you've learned something from today's live and um, thank you too to nutritional therapist Sophia Burrell. <laughs> you're very and welcome. And if you want to connect with Sophia, you're you're on social. And I know you're very active on Instagram. Um, is is that a Sophia Hill? So yes, Sophia Hill Nutrition. And if you want to send me an email, you can contact me that way as well. That's my preferred um, source of contact is email, and it's hello at sophiahillnutrition.com that's right yeah. so thank you so much um and uh, thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of today thank you thank again, you linda everybody. thank yes, you bye now thanks a lot everyone bye bye, -bye. <laughs> bye, -bye.